Can you see us, Hatun? I can see you. Can you see me? Yes. I can see you, but I can't see us. Oh, well, no, I can see you. That's all important to us. So just okay. for the practical side, uh, before we start, can I just get quick confirmation that you are happy to be uh, recorded on this live stream? Yes. Can't say about him. Yeah, I am. Good. Can you like be kind of close to one another? Because yeah. currently Jay took Just over the screen and we can't even see Brother Akfadi. Or okay. no, I think Kamra needs to go a little bit farther from you. Yes, better. Better. Uh, are we both? We can't see ourselves, so I have no idea. Why don't you put her up on yours so we can see what we're looking at? Yeah. yeah so, uh, I need Kamra to a little bit farther from you so that I can see both of you yeah okay it's better it's better uh, thank you very much for joining me guys how are you well we have been working all morning and afternoon we have been going through an awful ma amazing material by gibson uh we went through this whole controversy between king and gibson that's right uh that's all going to be coming up we also let me just pull a bit further yet we also went and did a, a, a uh, looked at all of Gibson's newest material, and then we're going to be uh, later on. We'll be doing some material uh, looking at the manuscripts. So an awful lot of an awful lot of of good, exciting, but uh, research is coming to YouTube. It's going to be coming to both Sira International, which is Alfadi's channel, and also to Fander Films, and we're going to send it to you to put up on DCCI Hatun. Okay. Okay. Um, I look forward to receiving that. And um, peace of Christ be with you, Al Fadi. How are you? I'm doing fine. Thank you for the invitation. How is life treating you guys? So I think I need some like kind of I don't know explanation <laughs> from Jay, for example. Uh, we were so we were assuming you we were going to do Zoom with this uh, in this studio. Zoom works really well. They're set up for Zoom. Uh, they have all kinds of equipment but they they're not set up for Skype so that was the problem we didn't realize that uh, that uh, that the that we were going to be doing using Skype on this that was the only difficulty okay that's fine anyway so we are all together now and we've got um, some people are watching us so um, if anyone has any question on Al Fadi or Jay Smith please please put um, add in front of DCCI ministries and hopefully that will get my attention Mm -hmm. um, so what have you got f for me in Agenda J or Al Fadi? To begin with, let's go through these. We you did want to talk about the coins very quickly, and I could do a quick overview for you with you, Hatun, on the coins. Uh, what, why we're even bringing this up? What's the significance of these earliest coins? Uh, what I want to do is with Al Fadi here, who speaks Arabic. I want him to look at the coins, and I want him to read the Arabic on the coins, since he is the one that can do it better than any of us. So if I if if you could go ahead and pull up the the coins, you okay. have them here. Okay. So um. Better. Just a moment. So uh, we need to make sure we are looking on the same coins. Um, I'll try to find them here and then see where they are. Um, and those of you who are watching us, you will remember last week, I think we had um, Jay with us and we went kind of went what happens in British Museum regarding when it came to the um, coins, Islamic coins and we find some interesting things and we just kind of since we've got brother al fadi with us we will be looking at them again to see um kind of make sure everyone understands the problem within islam uh, jay yeah i have access to the uh, notes you send it to me from last gathering uh, so if you tell me which slide you want me to show, I want you to I want you to look up the Sufyani Dirham from 661. It's called the Sufyani Dirham, post 661. If you could look for that one. Okay. Okay. Let me just remember how I share the screen. Just give me a minute, and then I will. Um, 
Okay, I believe I believe people are able to see I believe people are able to see the slides on um yes, Sufani Dram post 661. Okay, I can open it. Yeah. It, um just if you are seeing um us on YouTube um just beware you get to J you will kind of th see the things approximate 20 second after I put them up okay okay yes can you see them now I'm assuming we, we can yeah so Sufani drums has three men in one side and in other side is writings on the uh, pillars on the st so, uh, something Jay, you looks like um, kind of see the things approximate 20 second your, after Jay, I your up. youtube is on yeah i got it yeah. okay are you able to see it we are looking at yes, it now we are looking at it right now yeah. so what is this I want him to read the Arabic that's around it. So, uh, so the Arabic around it uh, reads, based on what I'm saying right now, uh, you have basically something that is saying Bismillah, and then meaning, um, uh, you know, basically in the name of Allah. And then the second part of that says, La ilaha illallah, there is no God but Allah, wahdahu, alone. There is no God but Allah alone. And then the third part says Muhammad Rasulullah. So that's basically what it reads it's almost like a three parts connected together bismillah la ilaha illallah wahdahu muhammad rasulullah in the name of allah there is no god but allah and uh, alone and muhammad is his messenger okay so look at the date uh the date uh, you mean in the uh in the 661 right in the slide itself yes 661 I so this like means muhammad's name is there before uh, before Abdul Malik. That's basically uh, based on this. Yes. So according to this, this is this coin shows that Muhammad's name is there in 661. That's 30 years earlier. Right. So that destroys this notion that Muhammad's name is not there till Abdul Malik introduces it. Uh, if this dating is correct, yes. Okay. Now we come down to this one here. Now, how do we know that dating is accurate? Well, because it's Sufyani. Sufyani is we're only in power. There, what I wanted to show you though before that is look at the fact that you have an image on that coin. Are we still talking about Sufyani dirham? Yeah. Okay. The Sufyani dirham. Which look one? At, this one. The one you have before the one the, the Sufyani one, the same one. Notice, notice it has an image of the caliph on there. If you go to the to the image above that, the one before that, and you will see not before that, the other direction. There is the drachma. If you go to one before that, yeah. to, is the drachma, Panzam, and there Panzam. is the image of the emperor with the two uh, with the two retainers on either side. Those images make sense because those would be Byzantine. That would be a Byzantine Correct. drachma. And you see, like the Greek, basically writing. And then you also have the Byzantine cross with the pedestal. When the Sufyanis introduced their coins, which is the one after that. That one is in 661. This is what we're told. We're not sure of the date, and that's why I'm wondering if this date is correct. They then take off the image of the emperor and put up the image of the uh, of the caliph with two retainers, take off the cross from the orb that they're holding in their hand, and they have the pedestal with not the cross piece, just with the pole sticking up. But, but let me ask a question. I mean, I'm just being critical here of the dates. Um, at that time, supposedly Ali ibn Abi Talib was still the last caliph, and this would have been the end of his caliphate. Are you telling me that the Sufyani took over and immediately reminted this? Okay, the reason why that, that, uh, that what we're saying is in order for, because they don't have television and radio back then, how would they introduce who they are? How would they let people know that they are now the new power? People in the, in the cities would know that. The only way they could actually introduce who they are is by minting new coins and then dispersing those coins throughout the empire. And that would have happened immediately the same year, the transition between Ali uh, being assassinated and someone else taken uh, taken over? Well, actually, this is, we're saying post-661. We're not saying exactly 661. Okay, okay. We just know that that's when they came to power, in 661. Right. So it could have been it could have been sometime during the Sufyani period. But nonetheless, 
This is how they then introduce who they are. Back in those days, that would make sense. Right. Are you following that, Hatun? Um, yeah, but let me just bring up something. Um, there is a coin um, uh, which is known as the earliest um, name of Muhammad in Muslim text, which is dated um, uh, in the time of Abu Zabur 685, 686 which has Bismillah and also which has name of Muhammad. This would predate that, it looks like. Hmm. Okay. Ibn Zubair only does, Ibn Zubair in <coughs> 87 is the one that confronts and destroys Petra and takes the black rock from Petra in 687 and goes down to the south. He confronts Abdul Blanak, who had came to power two or years earlier in 685. This is in 660s, so we're talking about another 20 years before that. Okay. Um, let me just... Um, so you weren't able to... Um, you weren't able to see it, okay? But uh, let me just try to do something. Sorry, just give me a second. So I'm just gonna send you something through Skype. Can you can you get message from Skype or will it be complicated? It may be too complicated. Could you send it through by phone? Okay, I can't do that. Um. Anyway, just okay. Just ignore that. It's fine. We can deal. That. We can look at them after the after the stream. It's absolutely fine. So what we're saying with the coins is the coins are another means of putting together what we now know of how Islam emerged. And it's important that we do this. It's important that we do look at this because if you're going to look, if you're going to see what the artifacts are saying, they have to support what the documentary evidence is saying, which also supports what the manuscript evidence. I'm questioning whether or not the idea that Muhammad is only introduced by Abdul Malik is correct. Because we've been told this for many years that it was he that introduced it on the coins in his uh, during his uh, 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 rulership from 685 to 705, but he does so in 692, and that's the coin that you see that comes on later. You see the coins of him with a with a sword in his hand. That's yeah. 692, and then well, this goes so quick; it's hard to control. Yeah. So you wanna. The one after that, yeah, if you go to the one after that. And the one that follows that, where he takes off his own image of himself and introduces a script. Now, can you read that script there in Arabic? So this script now, uh, which says uh, 692, around Abdul Malik time, uh, in the middle, it says, um, basically, it's uh, portions of chapter 112, says, Allahu Ahad, Allahu Samad, Lem Yalid Walam Yulid. So this is from chapter 112. It doesn't have the full verse saying Qul Hu Allah. I had just took the portion that uh, uh, Allah is Ahad, and I want to emphasize Ahad doesn't mean one. By the way, uh, yeah, he is the only, uh, you know, basically uh, uh, one, and he um, does not beget nor is begotten. Uh, so that's in the center. I'm trying to see what is written. Um, uh, around the perimeter, basically, and I need some time really to try to decipher this one because uh, it is not as clear. If we are, if um, so, the the coin you are looking um, inside gives Surah 112. The around, I think this is like what I read. It says, "Bismil Allah, Druba, Hadha Dinar." Of course, my pronunciation wouldn't make any sense to you. Uh, but apparently that's what it kind of says according to my notes. Would you know what that means? Um, you know, I think I see the portion you're saying, Bismillah, right here. And you're saying it's uh, the Duruba, word is... Uh, Duruba Hadha Duru Dinar. No, it's, it's, I think it means Doriba Hadha Dinar. Fi Senat Tahamam Wasaib. 
the Senate. Uh, okay, so it's probably it's that's over. So get that, that's fine. We can look into that. It's for, so it's saying this dinar was minted and it's given you the year now. Yeah, in year seventy eight. I have to look at it and read it. I'm unable to read it uh, this way, but uh, I'll take, uh, you know, uh, you probably have deciphered it. Somebody deciphered it for you. Uh, yeah, I did. Ask, yeah, uh, but it's fine. Like, um, you are, like, we can, we can look at it later. So it's fine. Okay. So what we're saying is this is, this is around seven, 700, 698, 700 AD is what you're saying. Yeah, because I'm not seeing the I, I see what's Sabine, but I'm not seeing the number eight, basically, Thamania. Yeah, yeah the, the, the word is, is doesn't appear to be that way. But again, I have to look at it, uh, uh, you know, uh, later. And this is, that. but nonetheless, this is in the, the during the time of Abdul Malik. So 698 to 700, he comes to power in 685 up to 705. So this would be introduced at this time. That's important because we now see that this, uh, the images are not taken off the eye. Problem with iconoclasm, I think, I'm assuming, begins with Abdul Malik. He takes off his own image, mm -hmm. replaces it with a script, which is the Shahada, right. which still is not found in the Quran uh, like it is found here. Yeah, I mean, the Shahada, it's, it's a known fact that you cannot find a single verse in the Quran that talks about it or commands Muslim to repeat it, for instance. In fact, in one incident, it actually claims that the hypocrites are the one who are making portion of that Shahada. So it, it was like using a negative, technically speaking. But to find the full Shahada, the full creed, you won't be able to do so in the Quran. Okay, so that's significant, and we need to underline that. Right. Now, Hutton, one of the but, things we want to do this afternoon while we have you, okay, and it's um, good. Just a moment, just a moment, Jay. So, if we can't find Shahada in the Quran, full form, and when someone becomes a Muslim, they must s verbalize the Shahada. That's correct, and that's the argument that I use yeah, so all the time. Like, you use it also that it's a man-made formula. I know it's just sad. It's just sad. Um, Jay, before I pass on to you, I've got a question from the chat. Someone is asking, um, "Can we get the background of Al Fadi? What does he do?" Over to you. So, what's the question again? Uh, they want, "What is your background, and what do you do?" Oh, well, my background, I am a former Muslim from Saudi Arabia. And um, what do I do now? I'm a full time in ministry. Uh, I love apologetics. I do a lot of videos. I have my own channel called Sira International. And I have Facebook, of course, called also uh, alfadi.sira. And we have Sira International Facebook page. Uh, so this is pretty much what I do uh, training, equipping, teaching. It's all around the rhythm of apologetics primarily. What and does Sira uh, stand for? Chemically speaking, I uh, have a uh, two masters, uh, but I'm working on my PhD. Uh, one of my masters, by the way, is in biblical communications, one in engineering, and now I'm working on my PhD on uh, uh, one of the earliest Quranic manuscripts. So you are pretty clever. Good. Well, <laughs> Good that you are in our uh, side. Glory to God. Um, yes, Jay. Uh, Al Fadi and I have been working quite a bit together. How long have we known each other? You know, a few years now. I mean, I've known of you many years ago, and uh, you probably began to hear of me also years ago. But we met for the first time three years ago, and we began to do this together two years ago. And we want to do an awful lot more with you, Hatu, and the three of us together working. And that's why it's important that this is the first time the three of us have all been together. So this mark this date on your calendar. What is today? The 17th of, of the, it's nearly end of the year now what i would like to do and uh, if you if it's okay can we segue now to something new yes you can lead the evening jay with knowing that you are not in my loving list now that's right i've been put into a hate group as, as a result of this mix-up follow up can we can we get uh, uh the live of, of that feed? I don't know if you can do that. Yeah, well, it looks like it's thinking right now. Okay, it's still trying to re regroup. What I'd like to do is I'd like to ask you, Hatun, uh, in the work that you're doing there in London, and I'd like to ask you, Al Fadi, in the work that you're doing 
up on the internet, you're on Facebook, you're also on YouTube, you're also getting it, you're also engaging with Muslims, uh, quite uh, ongoing. What are the major questions? What are the major controversies you're coming up with? And I like to ask you, Hatun, don't drown yourself in that huge bottle. But as you're doing this, Hatun, uh, uh, there you're engaging on the ground uh, at Speaker's Corner uh, every Sunday. You're engaging on the internet on, on daily. What are the major controversies? And I'd like to start with you, Khatun. What are the major questions that you're coming up with? What are the major uh, discussion points that you're coming up with that people need to hear that we can also start working towards, start going into 2020? You mean um, the questions Muslims are asking or the questions Muslims fail to respond? Both end. Let's go both directions. So what are the questions you're hearing from them that, that would be apologetics? And what are the questions that you're engaging them with that would be polemics that you consider to be the most important? Um, I think Muslims or Islamic Dawah gangs are always asking the same question in different forms. So the questions on Trinity, sin and salvation, but first will be the Trinity, sin and salvation, and authority of the Bible, the reliability of the Bible. So the same classic questions they've been asking yeah. for, in my case, over 40 years. They have not got off those questions. It is because Islam fails to represent what Christians believe when it comes to identity and deity of Jesus, as well as when it comes to Christian God. Therefore, Muslims never listen. And that's the same thing every week. You just get week after week. Okay, uh, uh, this is the same questions I got. I was at Speaker's Corner for 25 years. You know that. I used to be at Speaker's Corner for 25 years. Absolutely. Of course, that's how I found out about you. Everybody keeps telling me, look at this crazy guy who stands on a platform and uh, yells at people. So when I watched you for the first time, I said, he is crazy. Yeah, it is kind of crazy. Now she's taken over that ministry. I think you've been there for five years, Hatun, or has it been uh, six years? I've been there since 2013. Okay, so I, six I was years. young. I was young. But now I got all that speakers going on. Well, you're getting better as you go. And I have been really impressed, Hatun, with how you're holding yourself, how you're handling yourself. One of the things that I'm uh, that that we noticed when when I started back in the 1990s, the questions were slightly different. They were so the, the Trinity was has always been there. That's for sure. Uh, it was much more to do with violence. It was much more to do with uh, the uh, some of the problems with morality of Christianity. They had a lot of problems with pastors, a lot of problems with uh, priests, Catholic priests especially, that were pedophiles. These are the kind of questions I used to get an awful lot more from. It became, a, it really changed though in after 9-11. After 9-11, no longer was uh, it, it, a Christianity questioned uh, as far as violence was concerned. Now Islam was questioned when it comes to violence because of 9-11. And so suddenly the narrative changed. It followed what was happening in the news. But the idea, the problem of the Trinity, the problem of Jesus Christology, and certainly the difficulty of Scripture always came up. Now, what are you getting there in your work on the Internet? What are the kind of questions you're getting hit, you getting hit with? Well, I mean, uh, I'll start with the silly ones. Uh, usually they attack my background. They call me a liar. Uh, they don't think I am definitely an Arab or even from Saudi. And then they go back to the same traditional objections. You know, um, the minute you ask I, I'd like to challenge Muslims, by the way, from the Quran. I use something that I, uh, I appreciate a lot uh, in terms of my outreach, and I call it reversal apologetics. I use the exact argument a Muslim will use and turn it around. So Muslims always will tell me, show me where did Jesus say, I am God, worship me. I go back and say, show me where did Allah say, I am your God, worship me. I mean, so, stuff like that. So um, they, they still come back with the same push about the Trinity, about the deity of Christ, about the Bible being corrupt. I mean, I haven't seen anything creative yet. However, there is a new trend that I'm not so sure really if maybe I'm noticing it, or maybe it's been around for a while and I'm just noticing it for the first time. The claim that Jesus has sinned, actually, which is an interesting thing. Uh, I don't know if you've heard this before from Muslims, that Jesus has sinned, no. Jesus has lied, yes, things like that. Yes, it does that. come. It does come time to time. Yeah. I mean, my only response to that usually is like, well, if that's the case, you have just destroyed the Quran because the Quran said that Jesus was sinless. 
So I'm not yeah. so sure really where you're coming up with this idea. It's chapter 19, verse 19. Yeah. So it's, a, it's it is it's an own goal to do that. Right. Yeah. And uh, I don't know. Have you come up? What have you done when you get that that question, Hatun? Um, I just simply say, so Allah got it wrong. Quran got it wrong. You shouldn't be Muslim. Okay, so you just put it right back on their laps. Yeah, like, I I think it's very important for me that as a Christian, I am faithful to my scripture. And I pray God, with the grace of God, I am faithful to my scripture. And you want uh, people of other faith to be faithful to their scripture. So you don't want them to go against their scripture. While their scripture tells us Jesus is sinless, you want them to follow that. So why would you, why, why on earth Muslim would go against Allah while Allah says Jesus is sinless, while Muhammad himself confirms that no one, uh, Satan didn't touch Jesus. Who do Muslims think they are? They are telling me Jesus is sinful. Are Muslims much better than, are Muslims much better than uh, Allah and Muhammad? Um, but I just want to, if that's possible, Jay, I know you are leading the evening, but um, ask uh, Brother Al-Fadi, what is the reason that Muslims do, uh, do not believe that you are, not Arab and you were never Christ Muslim before because Islam is like so perfect. <laughs> no well, one will believe it. I, 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 for, I heard the question. Uh, I can tell you this much. Um, I don't want to brag, Sister Hatoon, but I can tell you this much. Um, it appears to me that the days of our Muslim friends making claims that, oh, Jay doesn't speak Arabic, uh, oh, David Wood doesn't understand the Quran, oh, so-and-so doesn't really know anything about the Arab culture, or you've never grown up in Saudi, that those days are destroyed. Here I am from Saudi, in Arab background, ex-Muslim, I have access to the Arabic sources, Islamic sources, primary sources, Sources that our Muslim friends don't even have access to or sometimes don't even know how to understand it or read it. Of course, I expect them to attack my background because that's the only channel they have to try to discredit what I'm doing. And I tell people I'm not here to uh, use this to bring glory to my name. No, no, I'm here to work with my brothers and sisters to bring justification to the hard work you've been doing for many years and decades as the case with Jay, because I've been watching how Muslims have attacked you many times, and I'm thankful that the Lord has really opened my eyes to the truth and has given me this platform to come alongside each one of you just to support what you're doing. I'm still learning from all of you about ways and techniques and approaches, but that doesn't discount the fact that I tell I'm a Muslim, if you doubt I'm an Arab, Come on, on on my show or come on my channel and let's talk in Arabic. Uh, let me show you if I can speak it or not. In fact, I challenge any of their debaters, Zakir Nayak or anyone else, to come and debate me in Arabic if that's the case. I did, um, I did ask the question because I do get to hear from Muslims, Islam is so perfect, so beautiful. If you were Muslim, you will never give up Islam. That's why I asked. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, can I say something about this? Because I think one of the difficulties for a lot of Muslims is that they just don't see the converts. And there's a reason why they don't see the converts. Uh, you two are unique in that you are willing to go public with your faith. Uh, you two are unique because having come out of Islam, if you go public with your faith, you could be killed. Uh, this is in chapter 4, verse 89 of the Quran. They, the law of apostasy is well known throughout Islam. Certainly, Yusuf Qadadawi, when he was on Al Jazeera Television, he said this a number of years ago that without the law of apostasy, Islam would not exist. That's true. It is. In all, it's not that it's impossible. It's not healthy for anybody who has left Islam and become a Christian to then go public about it. So Muslims will not see many of them. We don't. We don't talk about our converts. We're very careful to protect them. It's rare to find two people like you who are willing to go not only to talk about Islam, but to also confront Islam, knowing that as apostates, you carry a much higher price than, say, I do or anybody else listening. We were just talking and we just did a series uh, looking at academia. We're, by the way, looking at the comments on we're our We're watching phones, the comments. That's what know. we're looking down at our phones. Oh, yeah. We want to see what the comments are. Okay. Yeah. 
Now, one of the things that we uh, that we have found, and we just talked about this, both of us are in academia. I've got my doctorate. Uh, you're in the process of getting your doctorate. Uh, Al Fadi will be one of the well, will be one of the world's authority on the Sana manuscript. Now, remember, Al Fadi doesn't not only speak Arabic; he speaks Hijazi. He speaks the Arabic of the Hijaz, the central part of Arabia. He comes from just outside of Jeddah. That would be the same Arabic that if the Prophet Muhammad did speak it, it would be his 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 Arabic. It will be close to that. What we're now saying, although we, we actually are almost disagreeing with that last statement, it looks like Muhammad did not come from the Hijaz, actually, and it looks like the Quranic Arabic does not come from the Hijaz as well. That's right. The Quranic Arabic is actually comes from much further north. That's all coming out now in this new material that we're introducing, uh, that we've been recording the last two days. But this idea of uh, attacking the person, attacking the uh, the individual, this is coming out really strong in academia as well, Hatun. Both of us are getting attacked. We ha and we're finding that many of our colleagues who are doing work with us cannot go public with what they're finding. Do you want to say something about that? Um, yes, me and Jay really invested uh, uh, a number of actually of episodes addressing issues like this. It's a very sad reality that we are faced with that you have brilliant uh, people in the academic field who are coming across amazing discoveries, and yet because it is part of the Islamic basically uh, studies, uh, they hesitate or even shy away from even making it public. Uh, now, they do write in their academic circle, by the way. I've read many articles. Jay read many articles. I'm sure you read many articles. Uh, a lot of wonderful discoveries. But the minute you ask him, could you come on a show? Can you publish it uh, in, a, in a way that allows for a critical thinking? Uh, they uh, Almost all of a sudden, they want to distance themselves from you or even distance themselves completely from even trying to use it in a critical manner to reason, you know, with others like Muslims in this case and say, look, this is the discovery. What does that make you feel now? How does that make you feel about what you've learned versus what is being found? Like, let's use, for instance, the corrections that are made to the Quranic man early Quranic manuscripts. My goodness, I grew up as a Muslim never once that I was told that a single Quranic manuscript have a single error in it or even a correction made to it. Okay, that's fine. Now we discovered it. Why can't I, as a Muslim, think about it? Why can't I reason with what does that tell me about the history of the Quran? No, it's taboo. You cannot touch it. There is all kind of explanation that are sometimes down silly, actually, to try just to protect this narrative that no changes were done to the Quran, things like that. This is just an example. And you're finding a lot of basically, um, uh, you know, academicians, unfortunately, that even some, we use an example of one, that use vitriol language uh, because somehow they feel offended by others like us daring to bring about discoveries out in the open and use it in a critical manner. William, I've had this happen personally to me, Hatun. We, I, I, back in 1994, when I was studying under Gerald, Dr. Gerald Hotting there at School of Origin African Studies, I was studying this material uh, that we have introduced. Both you have, I have introduced, Al Fadi and I have introduced, looking at Mecca, looking at the earliest manuscripts, looking at also the problem with the Qibla. These I uh, introduced in a debate that I had with Dr. Jamal Madawi in 1995. But not, back before I did that debate, I wanted to, uh, I knew Dr. Patricia Corona. She was uh, head of department at Cambridge University at the time. Having having written the book in 1987 on Meccan trade, she got a death threat, moved to Cambridge University, and uh, was uh, was writing still. When I went to, into her office, and we we were good friends. I was actually was actually one of my supervisors. Uh, I was not from Cambridge. She was. And as uh, when I went into the office, I wanted to her to help me to get ready for this debate I was going to do with Dr. Jamal Badawi. She went right through all my 10 categories. She says, that's good. That's not good. Here's a better way to say it. And then finally, I turned to her and I said, well, why is not you not doing this debate? Why don't you do this debate since you're the one that is the expert in this area? You're the one that did most of the research. And she kind of looked at me and kind of laughed. And she says, you know, Jay, I don't have the freedom that you have. She says, I am an academic. We cannot, we're not permitted to come to conclusions on what we find. Uh, she says, you, however, you can say anything you want. You have no chair to protect. You have no, uh, no uh, department to protect. 
And that's where the penny dropped for me. And that was back in 1990, uh, 1995, I'm sorry, not 1994, 1995 when she said that. Now, she's no longer living, unfortunately. She died in the last two years. But is there is this fear in academia about coming to conclusions about any of the newest research that we're finding. We've just gone through this series with Dr. David King versus uh, Dan Gibson and the enormous vitriol wasn't it it was just it's it was just true. foul it, it was embarrassing it was actually. embarrassing for us to read it because dr king obviously just belittled dan gibson the things he said about dan gibson this man has no qualifications this man has not studied under me how dare he assume that he knows anything about the kibla i'm the world authority on the kibla he kept on trying to aggrandize himself and you can see that at the very end, then he says, this is dangerous what Dan Gibson is doing. Because uh, why is it dangerous? Because this will cause Islamophobia attacks. And look at the reason. And the reason why is because it comes up with dubious findings. And what was fascinating, he said that we should not use anything from modern time and try to understand what was happening back in the ancient times. Now, um, must, when just, you... I'm a bit Go concerned. Too. I'm a bit concerned because like in my study room, I have lots of critical additional or critical books about Christian faith. It is written by Christians, by non-Christians and by Muslims. And last week I was given um, a booklet by Muslim missionary from uh, someone who does Dawah and they were critiquing my God. Why when it comes to Christianity, it is allowed, but when it comes to religion of peace, it is not allowed, even in academic circle. I think that is just sad and like double sad. Yeah, and I remember uh, as we were reading this and going through it together, Al Fadi and I, I finally had to turn to him and I said, you know, you, after a while, you just don't want to continue reading this because this is embarrassing to Dr. David King. If someone cannot answer the criticism that is coming forward and has to use vitriol and has to use ad hominem and has to then attack the character and then even start name calling, calling them an Islamophobe and uh, suggesting that harm will come to Muslims because of this material, that I would suggest that that they have run out of they have run out of, of the uh, they, they have run out of ideas and the argument no longer is tangible to them and that's possibly the reason why they had to, they have to have come with this kind of response. Now in Christianity we don't do that. I would there may be historically there may be times when that was done, but certainly not today. In fact, I would suggest the more they critical material that they can come across on the Bible or on the person of Jesus Christ, bring it on. Because that engages us, does it not? Absolutely. It engages us Absolutely. to not only de defend Jesus, because he is the only one that can be defended. And the Bible is the only book that has gone through every area of criticism. You don't have historical criticism without biblical criticism. Redacted criticism, source criticism, all these different criticism, literary criticism, all of these were created on the Bible, now are being used on the Quran. And what Dan Gibson has done is he has actually gone to these places uh, where all these these Kiblas were going in all directions, as King says, in so many directions because these people were so barbaric, they couldn't have known what the true direction was. Turns out when King, uh, when Gibson went there, he says they're not in all, all many directions. They're actually only in four directions, uh, three of them outside of Mecca itself. And in every case, he was able to show that the pattern follows the political engagement on the ground. If you look and see what's happening historically, if you look and see what's happening politically, you will then understand why there are Kiblas facing in between, why there are Kiblas facing Petra, why there are Kiblas facing Parallel, and finally, why there are Kiblas facing Mecca. It all follows what's happening hit on the, uh, between these two great empires that were vying with each other. Now, to me, that is perfectly legitimate to ask that question. It's perfectly also legitimate to come up with that conclusion. Why in the world suddenly is he called an Islamophobe for asking these kind of questions? Why are we called Islamophobes? Remember, Hatun, a year ago, I was denied access to a university in Hong Kong to do my lecture 
the year before that, two years ago, in the same city, I was in the middle of my lecture at a very famous university, and they came in and had me leave with all my audience. I had over 200 people. It was standing room only, and they made us all leave that uh, venue to go down to a church at the bottom of the hill. Why? Because only in every case, only one Muslim went to the authorities and said that I was an Islamophobe. Right. And, and, and here is, here is a, a, an assumption. Let, let's hypothetically assume that the Islamic or early Islamic scholars um, would go back in time and enter into the seventh century Islam. Don't they want to really see the real early Muslims talk to them, understand how they thought, how they memorized the Quran, how they understood religion and things like that? Why is it then when somebody from our background, like me and you, Hatun, who come from the Islamic side, we understand Islam, we think like Muslims, we know what Islam teaches, yeah. we're discounted completely. We're completely discounted and marginalized like we don't even exist. There's two reasons that I think. I don't know what you're going to say, Hatun. One is they're threatened by you. They're threatened by both of you because you stand against everything that they're fearful might happen to them. And I... I you can see why they do not want you to go public. They absolutely are fearful that if you go public, everything that great that great edifice of Islam will come crashing down. You threaten them more than anybody else. Secondly, they see you as traitors because you. That's the Islamic view. The Islamic they're view. They're buying into it. And it's fascinating to me that when you look at the latest statistics put out by Pew International on conversions, that means people who change voluntarily from one faith to the other, the evangelical world right now, it has a 5% conversion rate. The Islamic world has a 2.5% conversion rate, which is half the conversion rate of evangelical Christianity. Proving to me that when it comes to choice, real choice, People are leaving Islam, becoming Christians at twice the number as those that are going the other way. Secondly, on top of that, when they have done studies on converts to Islam, the normal number of years that new converts stay in Islam is only three years. Yeah, that's the average, especially with female. Especially with females, because many of them are become Muslims because they married a Muslim man. Right. They have to convert. And so they're part of that number, which inflates that number enormously. Correct. Only three years. Why is it that they stay only three years? I would suggest because they finally realize, they finally see that romanticism that uh, they introduced them to Islam, that gets worn down pretty quick. And we can see that example after example, even in the reaction I'm getting on these comments here. Take a look at the reaction of the Muslims. These are not pleasant comments. The fact that Muslims don't know how to behave, even in public. They don't know how to respond, even in public. Well, I can tell you, uh, here, here is the frustrating part, is like somehow our friends who are Muslims here think they're superior to us. Think they can just say whatever they want, and anytime they want it, however they want it. But dare you say even half of what they say, they report to you, they complain, and you know, I don't blame them because everybody's on their side immediately once they do that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, someone has commented here is once they read about Islam, they leave. And that's understandable. And I would even say once they see the underbelly of Islam, the true belly of Islam, uh, we we were um, uh, we have noticed this. I could I could even uh, having my wife and I, I have to be careful. I don't want to maybe I won't bring that into it because that's something that my wife and I noticed in Senegal. We could almost recognize who a Catholic was and who a Muslim was just by looking at their faces just by looking how they would respond to us in Wolof. We could almost do that. I could almost do that by looking at a Muslim or a Hindu in India. We can almost say by looking at their face if they're a Muslim or Hindu, because there's something about Islam that starts to tear you down. Right. It right. does tear you down emotionally. It does tear you down socially. And that has to take a, a that has to start abuse your body at points and even your face and we would I have to be careful because this in some ways this is only personal experience I, and I don't want to make this a dictum what we do know is that when you look at the cultures that Islam produces when you look and see what Islam has produced for 1400 years we keep on hearing about the great uh, the, the, the great discoveries it's made and when we remember when we went to the museum there to back in September uh, we looked at all these supposed the great influence that Islam had on the world. When we kind of we looked at, we kind of laughed, didn't we? Because many of those things that they were 
crediting Islam for were not from Islam at all. They were from countries right next to Muslim countries. A lot of them came out of India. Others came out of China. But very few of these discoveries really comes out of Islam. Though, do you find many people who will then confront Muslims for making these claims? Did you notice, Hatun, when we were there in the British museums, they had two galleries dedicated to Islam. You remember that? Yeah. Was there any gallery dedicated to Hinduism or the discoveries of Buddhism or the discoveries of Christianity? No, there is no galleries dedicated to one religion. They are dedicated to geographical locations. Yes, the Byzantine world, uh, the Sassanid world, uh, the, the European world. The, uh, we have all kinds of galleries dedicated to these geographical locations and periods in history, but not to a religion. And to me, that suggests that there is this almost a almost bending over backwards here in the West for us to placate Muslims because we want so much for them to have an identity that's positive because there's so little that Islam can point to that is positive. Yeah. And you know, uh, Hatun, can, can I respond to a comment in here? Yes, you can. Um... Okay, so, so there is this person, uh, Al Hazen, uh, Hassan, I don't know how to pronounce it. I apologize in advance. He's speaking to someone here, his uh, name is Enoch, and saying, yes, a prophet is descendant, he's saying, base, uh, descended from Abraham through Ishmael. My first question, please show me where did you get this idea from in the Quran. If you can show me this verse, I'll apologize to you right now. Number two, on top of this, there is the second part. God's covenant with the Jews ended when trying to get Jesus crucified. Please show me evidence of this that that's the case and jesus by the way was crucified by the account of people who are not even christians so please don't embarrass yourself by making comments like this and then the list go goes on and on and on this is the kind of stuff by the way that frustrates me because it's been dealt with over and over and over and over again and our muslim friends don't want to even take the time to go and investigate even evidence that is presented by the way we're living in 21st century and there is youtube and many other platforms that you can go to and learn about these facts. In fact, you can even use technology called airplane. You can fly and go to places and see. You can even go and ask people these days to use another technology called FaceTime. They can go on your behalf and they can just show you things. Why don't we just apply these kind of things and stop making these really joke comments, actually, because it's really embarrassing when you start repeating the same thing over and over again. That's welcome to the world of Islam. That happens to us like every every week, every day even. Um, on that point, um, we were trying to help a Christian who is based in Middle Eastern country. I don't think at this stage I can give the name of it. So Muslims are asking this Christian that actually your Bible is corrupted. And we are helping her. Actually, no, Quran disagrees with her. And then we kind of present the case. And a, Muslim, a Christian got back to us by saying she can't use Quran against Muslims because um, she will go to prison if she does that. Yeah, I believe it. I believe no. it. We have to be always creative on how to um, help our Muslim friends just... Um, just, I mean, I hate to use the word logic. Use logic. Sometimes it's just the idea of just taking a moment to think about the question that is being asked. Just think about it for a second and then ask yourself, are there facts to support my assumptions? Okay. You, I, don't, you were, I don't know if any of you too easy to remember back in 19, were you in Britain in uh, 2006, 2007? Uh, no, yeah. not you, but were you in Britain? No, you weren't yeah. in Britain that early. Uh, at that time, Tony Blair's government was uh, put before Parliament in the, the what they call the incitement to religious hatred law. Are you familiar with that law? I heard uh, of it. Not necessarily. You've heard about it, though, haven't yeah. you? Yeah. This was a law that was put before Parliament, which went to the House of Lords, came back to Parliament, put in by the Council, the Muslim Council of Britain, MCB, uh, that stipulated that if anybody criticized the Quran or if anybody criticized Muhammad, it'd be a be punishable of by seven years in prison. That's in Britain. In Britain. This is Britain. This is not in the Muslim world. This is in Britain, which is a European country. 
uh, which is it has a Christian memory, it has a Christian foundation where you can criticize anything you want. There, I think the only restrictions they have in Britain is that you cannot deny the Holocaust. I, I don't think there's anything else. Oh, I know uh, one other law: you cannot go into a movie theater and yell fire, unless there is a fire. I so, guess now that I guess now that needs to be changed. Wherever you go, don't shout as Allah there. <laughs> that Allah is not God. So because there is no God, but this Allah. went back and forth between the House of Commons and the House of Lords three times. It came back to the House of Commons for the final vote. In that vote, that law would have gone through except for one vote. That's how close. Now remember, in the House of Parliament, there are uh, uh, member there are six hundred members of Parliament. That law missed by one vote. Guess whose vote it was? It was Tony Blair's vote. Tony Blair, looking at the hands that were going up, realized that this law would go through, that he had instituted, that he was allowing to happen. He didn't ever think this law would go through. When he realized that it would actually go through, he quickly stepped outside the door and his vote, his vote was not counted. That's how close we came in Britain to eradicating any criticism of Islam. Because if you can't confront the Quran, if you can't confront Muhammad, what do you, what's left? That's really the only two things that hold up Islam. Islam is really de dependent on just those two things. I would have been thrown out of the country. Anybody that was working with me would have been thrown out of the country if we were, we were not citizens. Now, for that reason, can you see, when I look back and I try to understand, is that has there been ever any law like that about the Bible or Jesus Christ? Of course not. Is there any country in the world that stipulates that you cannot confront the person of Jesus or the Bible? Thank God we don't have laws. But what does that say about Islam? And what does that say about Muslims? Because that tells me that Muslims are not prepared to defend their Quran. They're not prepared to defend, to defend their prophet. So the only thing they have left for them is to destroy it by, by putting laws and institutions that eradicate any criticism. And that to me shows that Islam is not really defendable. Whereas my Lord Jesus Christ, my goodness, is he defendable? He predicted that we will be hated for his name's sake, that we will be persecuted. What does that mean? He predicted that laws will be against him and our belief in him. He predicted that. And so also, also, if you look at the Christian scripture, God of the Bible in the account of creation his goodness has been questioned by first man and first woman. He didn't destroy them and then said, okay, I'm going to make new man. Um, his goodness has been questioned by his people as well as by foreign nations. Lord Jesus Christ was critiqued and questioned, but we were able to deal with the questions. God of Bible is not afraid of being critiqued or being questioned. But when it comes to Islam, how does Allah deal with the people who critique him? How does Muhammad deal with people who critique him? And how does Muslims deal with people who critique Islam? It it's all goes the teachings of the book and the man. That's right. Yeah, and this is, I mean, this is why it, if you want to know what Muslims are to do, you've always said this, Hatun, we've had this discussion many times, we just did it recently, about looking and see what Muhammad did to those who criticized them. Uh, 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 we talked about uh, uh, Bint Marwan, Asafa Bint Marwan, we talked about Abu Afak, we talked about also the problems of the Banu Kanuka family, the Banu Nadir and the Banu uh, Quraiza family there in Medina. Anytime any Jews or even women uh, criticized Muhammad, he had them killed, he had them stabbed, uh, he had them thrown out like the Banu Kainuka family, he had them thrown out like the Banu Nadir, and then finally he had all the men in the Banu Quraiza family, had 800 of their men had their throats slit. If this is the example of the founder of Islam, if this is the example of the model for Islam, if that's what he did, I can under then understand why Muslims do what they have to do. And I love Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is such a contrast. It is such an antidote to that. It's such an alternative to that. Jesus Christ would not even allow his own disciples to defend him when they attacked, when he was attacked there in the Garden of Gethsemane. And that's why in some ways, if you want to find a model for today, boy, you better come on home. Come on home to Jesus Christ. Amen. If you want to find a model today, 
come on home to his example, to his model, and come on home to those of us who try to, as much as we can, as best as we can, to try to model that in our own lives. That's why uh, we don't have, do we? We don't have demonstrations against people who, who uh, I tell them that they must be eradicated or they must be put into prison for seven years. There is no such thing as incitement to religious hatred law to deal with Christianity. There is no such word called Christianophobia. That only exists for Islam. A phobia for Islam is unique to that one religion, and that's why no other religion has it attached to it. Amen. And I mean, I, I want to just make a, a, a quick observation. Um, uh, this is really a question to uh, our Muslim friends here and those that will be watching it. I want you to think about this question and ask yourself, which God is mightier and stronger? The one that allowed his truth to spread for 2,000 years despite persecution and killing of his followers without a single command by him for them to go and fight and defend themselves by the sword, or the one that commanded the use of the sword to silent his own critics by the hand of his followers? You tell me. Of course, remember Allah, um, Surah 5, 101, 102, Muslims can't even ask questions. Of course. Yeah, do not ask. Yeah. Okay, Hunter, let's go the other direction now. Let's take that. And this is a good segue. What are you finding are the best polemics? What are you finding are the best questions to throw at Muslims? Or what are you finding the ones that they have the most difficult time with? In your experience, in your ministry, there in London, of course, you do others in other places, but also on the Internet uh, in your debates that you have in your live streams. What are the best material that you've come up with that you could share with us? Um, I think anything about Allah, Muhammad and Quran, because those, those three things, because Muslims were never trained to answer basic questions. You ask them, oh, guys, uh, tell me about Islam, they will critic Christian faith. So they've got like no good news. They've got nothing to share with individuals. All they do is critic Islam, critic Christianity or other faiths. So they never studied their scripture. Therefore, we have no answer to the basic questions. We have no answer to the Quranic manuscripts. We have no answer uh, to question who does Allah pray to as Allah prays for Muhammad? We have no answer to the question on the wisdom of Allah when it comes to the breast suckling. We have no answer to the question on the, this famous verse in the Quran which Muslims must love Christians. We have like nothing. I don't know. I, I've got serious like no answer to my any basic questions <laughs> just ask them any question they have no answer jay I, it's fascinating when i go up on your dcci youtube account and i look at all your titles almost every video is no answer no answer no answer uh, at speaker's corner it seems to me that this is a recurring theme you're getting almost the exact same response to almost every question you're putting at and your first your first statement i think is the problem right there your first statement underlines the problem no one has really questioned them in these areas That's they right. are not taught how to be critical they are not used to having criticism thrown at them in these three areas especially and these three areas are absolutely devastating because if they cannot defend Allah, if they cannot defend Muhammad, if they cannot defend the Quran, then what's the re what's the re what's the purpose? There's nothing more to defend. Those really are what the foundations for Islam are. They not? I think the sad thing is, even the Dawa experts, they were supposed to be the one like who deal with the misconception about Islam. They are the ones who are bringing people to Islam, they can't even answer the basic questions. Sometimes I wonder why they simply just tell people about, like how they even convert people at the first place. I was recently in an event where, in a mosque, they were talking about how do we tell people about Islam during the Christmas. Like I heard lies after lies about Christian faith from ex-Christian 
who become a Muslim. And then when I ask him basic question, where did you get all those informations on Christian faith? Or what is your alternative as you destroy the faith of Christians on Christmas time? I was asked, please leave the mosque. Like they didn't even answer my basic question. If experts can't answer the basic question, what do you expect from those people who haven't even think about it? Like you are asking the questions on the Quranic manuscripts on the history of Islam. How many Dawa experts were able to answer the basic questions? Yeah. Zero, not even like minus. It's like minus, I think, not even zero. That's an, I mean, and that's that's a huge revealing. But what about you, and Alfari? In your work, what do you find are the best questions? You know, I, obviously, I'm I'm very active on Facebook. In addition to doing these series on YouTube, and people can always go and see uh, the work that we do there. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll share with them, at, with your permission, whenever you want me to, where they can go to Facebook. But nevertheless, I'm also in the same category like you in the no answers category, and I my questions are very specific. And I would say, okay, let me ask you this question. You tell me that the first pillar of Islam is the Shahada. Show me where is that Shahada in the Quran? No answer. You tell me that Islam came to basically fight idolatry and we Christians are worshiping an idol called the cross and a human being called Jesus. Doesn't the Shahada elevate Muhammad the human to be equal to Allah? Number one, number two, when you pray daily, don't you face a rock called the Kaaba? Isn't that idolatry? You see, these are the kind of things I ask. They tell you, I mean, about Muhammad is a descendant of Abraham through Ishmael. Show me. Prove it to me. That, I mean, this is the kind of stuff that I use, which is the exact phraseology syndrome, I call it. If you want to ask questions from the Bible and you claim that the Bible have no answers for them, you know what? I'm going to give you a taste of your medicine. I'm going to ask you now to prove any of the things that you believe in, technically speaking. My point is, I want you to think about the argument, because this sounds exactly the same as the argument that you typically raise against me. Does it sound rational to you to use that kind of things? Okay. Yeah. So outside of these kind of internal contradictions, are there any other areas that you have found that have been very healthy as far as, uh, um, well, that people that who are listening who then can uh, take with them and actually use in their own ministries. Well, obviously, I mean the, the work that we've been doing in the videos about these discoveries, you know, Petra, Mecca, you know, all that kind of stuff. That's something that is really uh, groundbreaking. And uh, why is that in, in your in your opinion? Why would that be something that people could use, or why is that something that they should use? Because it destroys the very foundation of Islam. I mean, uh, you see, we I tell people I'm an engineer, by the way. I I was in construction field, and I can tell you this much: you want to destroy a building, go for the foundation. That's it. That's the easy way to cause the entire building to tumble. You go for the foundation. So the birth of Islam has a lot of factors in it, <laughs> and the book, the location, all of those things are essential. If you go for the location and destroy that narrative that it was in this location, now we have evidence to prove that it was somewhere else, there is doubts now about it. If you go for the man itself, you know, uh, himself, and you begin to uh, raise questions about his origin, when did he come about in the picture and so on. So if you go for the book, like the early Quranic manuscript, and it's very clear to show insertions, erasures, corrections, then you've destroyed everything that has to do with the foundation. Yeah. Okay. Can I say one more thing about that? I would suggest that all these questions that you're uh, that you're uh, suggest. I mean, these questions that you're uh, putting forward before us, such as going and looking at the book, the man, the place, the God. Every one of these, when we ask these questions, are these are Christian polemic against them? No, are, they're not. No, they're not. They're they're, they're actually from their own sources. And has not their one of them is a Christian polemic. Is exactly. It? And isn't that the problem that most secular people think that we who are Christians, we dare ask these questions because we are basically where it's a competition between Christianity and Islam. This is a neutral polemic. These are neutral questions, which means anybody who is listening, anybody who's watching can use these questions. You don't have to be a religious person to ask where did 
uh, Islam began. You don't have to be a religious person to ask why is it that there's no reference to Mecca until 741? Why is it that when we look at Muhammad, we don't see him in the right place doing the right thing at the right time? Why is it when we look at Arabic, it looks like it comes from the Nabataean script, but more than that, it looks like even the constructs of the of the Quranic uh, Arabic comes straight out of Nabataeanism and nowhere else. Why is it though the the definite article oh, right. is is uniquely a Nabataean insertion, a Nabataean invention? This doesn't have, is not found in any other of the uh, any of the uh, of the other scripts. Why is it that Tar uh, um, uh, Tarban uh, what's it called uh, Marbuta? Marbuta, yeah. Marbuta. That is uniquely Nabataean. That is not found in any other script. Which is, these are these are things that are unique to a much northern script. These are this is a historical question, and that's very interesting. I, I like a really idea about the Tal Marbuta. I think somebody, uh, maybe maybe I will, uh, uh, need to go and look at the Quranic verses that use Tal Marbuta for words, and later use the Tam of Tuha, because that can indicate you know a shift in origin or and also the geography. timeline. There's exactly. Yeah. So these kind of questions are are would be that should be the whole opus the modus operandi for any historian who wants to know how Islam began or how the Quran to began or where the Quran became from. This is a neutral criticism. This is a neutral question. This is a historical question, which is has no should not have any uh, any polemical agenda coming from Christianity or any other religion. And that's why for those of you who are listening, it is this material that you can use better than any other because it is neutral. And because it is the same kind of questions that were asked of Christianity, Correct. it was asked of our Bible, uh, the documentary hypothesis, how can you have four different authorships for one book that supposedly came from one man? That's a good question. And nobody put a death threat up for, for uh, Wellhausen asking that. There has been no, I don't see any incrimination against the historians and the linguists who are still asking questions about the Bible. When Muslims bring this to you at, at, at Speaker's Corner, uh, uh, when they questions about your faith, about your background, about who Lord Jesus is, about uh, the whole concept of, of what the Trinity is all about. Do you sit there and, and, uh, and criticize their character for asking you these questions? They would be stupid to do so. In fact, you engage with them, don't you? You invite them. In fact, the reason we're even having this discussion, you have it open for people to question. I'm looking for questions here, and there's no questions. And some people it's are just asking people to ask questions. Yeah. DCCI, who are, DCCI stands for Defend Christ critic Islam. So we are there every week to answer basic questions or non-basic questions as well as critic the critic Islam. But can I ask a question to Al Fadi if that's okay? Yes. So just an advice. You take the examples of the many scripts where people with their own eyes, the eyes Allah giving to them where they can see the insertions, corrections in the manuscripts. You take down two different Arabic Qurans or 37 different Arabic Qurans. You take them Hadith and then like show them, they read it and they still call you liar. What would you do? What would I do? I mean, uh, at, at this point, all I can leave them with is basically telling him that if, if you're denying your own sources and what you're seeing already and denying even these simple questions, then there is nothing really left for me uh, to try to uh, basically share with you or even explain to you. And I'm gonna use an example like uh, something that you just suggested. How often do you get asked this question, Hatun or even Jay, show us the word Trinity in the Bible? How often do you get asked this question? If you can think about it in all of your uh, ministry career out. Uh, like I get that every week. Okay, what about you, Jay, since you started it? Have you ever been asked questions like this about the Trinity, the word Trinity? The word Trinity, it comes up. It doesn't come up that the question specifically. Something about the Trinity always comes up. But this one, where does the word itself found in the Bible? It's, it, it's uh, maybe, oh, certainly hundreds of times, but I wouldn't say it's the first question. Okay. Usually it's the, it's the concept of Trinity is more the problem. Every time I ask a Muslim about the word Tawheed in the Quran, they say, well, your, your argument is flawed. You're asking about something that is flawed. You know, well, you can't ask questions like this. Why do you ask me a question about the Trinity then and the word Trinity if that's if it is flawed? You see, it's funny how that when the table is turned around, all of a sudden I'm flawed now because I'm asking questions that I'm using the exact approach. That's all I'm doing. 
you're asking me a good question about the word Trinity. May I explain the Trinity to you why it's a doctrine? No, you know, it's either your Bible is corrupt because the word is not there. Okay, can I ask you a word? Where is the word Tawheed in the Quran? Can I use the same argument you just used? No, your argument is fraud. That's the problem that we're faced with. I have an answer for it, by the way. It is found in the Bible. The God of this age has blinded their minds. That's all I can say about that. Also, um, okay, like, word Trinity is a theological word. It's not in the Bible. Tawhid is a theological word, which is not in the Quran. But by the time people put the Quran together, they should know, Allah should know, word Trinity and Allah should put it that in the Quran. Allah doesn't even know about that word, but that's different topic anyway. Jay? I'm sorry, I was reading the, te the text down here. What was the question again? Sorry, repeat it. No, that wasn't the question. That was a comment which you didn't listen and my heart is broken, but I don't sorry. think... <laughs> okay, God bless you. Please forgive me. I was looking at some of the comments here. I'm just trying to figure out who's, who's talking here. But listen, I think this is this has been good that we're doing this. I think it's been good that we're finally connecting. I think it's great that we continue to have these kind of discussions together. I think it's important that we continue to also bring and keep the battle going against Islam. I know that we get criticized for that. Uh, I know that uh, that I well, I've had this for about 25 years where I've had lots of Christians criticizing me for even uh, going on the offense. It's uh, fascinating to me that that Muslims, they have no difficulty with Muslims going on the offense, but it seems to be a double standard. They don't like it when Christians go on the offense. There aren't enough of us, I think, who are doing polemics. Uh, we certainly do need the apologetics. We certainly do need to have an awful lot of the good defense, but we also need to go both directions. And I think it's great what you're doing there. Uh, I'd love to see what you're doing there on DCCI, this kind of material that you're putting up, getting us on board to come and, and share with you. I think it's great what Al-Fadi is doing on Sira International. I've been on doing it for Fander Films uh, since 2006. So I've been doing this for a good 13 years uh, on YouTube. But I would love to see more people put their face and go public. I would love to see more people uh, take uh, the material that we're uh, that we're teaching them and actually teach others and actually use it in their own locales I don't see enough of this going on yet, and I am not sure why can I ask a question to Al-Fadi again? Please do please do so there is a comment is coming up that you've done something to the Nigerian Muslims on Facebook um, Did you do something to the Nigerian Muslims on Facebook? Nigerian Muslims? Yeah what does that even mean? You mean uh, the group did, of Nigerian Muslims? Did you have debates with them or have you done any engagement with Muslims in Nigeria through Facebook? Not that I'm aware of. I always engage anyone who comes to Facebook and if they misbehave, I block them. So maybe you're talking about the blocked Nigerian Muslims. I There's a whole bunch of them. I don't know. Um, there is a couple of comments are just coming up. So um, I'm just assuming you butchered some of their ideology, but if you don't remember, it's fine. I think there is certainly an awful lot of his material gets to Nigeria, and I, I, he is well known in Nigeria. I would imagine because of the kind of nature of what he is working with, they are very upset with what he is coming across. I can see why they would feel very aggrieved, because he, um, as you well know, yourself, Al-Fadi, myself, Sam Shamoon, David Wood, Christian Prince, uh, there are many others who, but those are probably the bigger names. We are on the offense. We do confront Islam. Uh, there, uh, there are, uh, in more, we need more of this. And we're getting all over the world. And certainly we are now starting to actually start training in every one of these kind of question, uh, countries. Nigeria would be one of those. So I can see why that they would probably say you have been a real uh, thorn in their sign there. I mean, I honestly do not go and investigate uh, uh, the origin of where people come from, but I welcome, of course, any Muslim who come to my page. However, I have rules, by the way, uh, Hatun, and I say it publicly. If you come to my page just to troll and to distract and to divert and you think you own my page, I'll block you. I'll humiliate you and I'll block you also. And I'll humiliate you by asking you questions and show to everybody that you don't have answers for them. And then I'll block you because 
I'm not there to entertain, you know, uh, those kind of behaviors. We have people who are sincere, serious. They come ask questions. I have Muslims that send me private messages all the time and thank me for raising a question or even answering uh, certain things that are down about or even ask me sincere questions about certain things. And I appreciate that. And I, I can I understand why they come privately, because, you know, they, they can't really dare, unfortunately, to come publicly. And, you know, what happens usually when they are seen by their friends doing things like this? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, can I ask a question on um, so Christmas is approaching and around the world, mainly in Muslim majority countries, place of um, our Christian brothers and um, sisters is not good at all. Um, have you got any comments on that? Comments or would about you like me to repeat no, it? Christian brothers around the world during Christmas time, this is not the most pleasant time of year for them. Oh, uh, well, you know, I know, by the way, I speak for Christians, believe it or not, there are Christians in the Arabian Peninsula who uh, definitely lament the fact that they cannot at least have uh, this joy that we experience uh, uh, in celebrating the birth of our Lord. But, you know, uh, at the end of the day, uh, I rejoice for the fact that they are standing firm for their faith and that the joy that we have in us is, is much greater than the idea of just to have a you know, some sort of a, an outer celebration. But I understand their, uh, their frustration, of course. But yes, that's something that we all have to appreciate, that the freedom that we have sometimes, we really take it for granted, and we need to appreciate the fact that there are many who follow Jesus that can have even a single chance to share the Bible verse publicly, uh, share the story of Christ publicly, or even say anything about Christianity publicly. Yeah. Okay, well, listen, this has been exciting. We've, it's been good to finally get together. I would like to, uh, I would like to certainly invite other people to, I don't see many questions here. I see an awful lot by Sam Shamoon, who likes to take me down and wants to have me, he's bored to death by, he's going to sleep on what we're saying here. Uh, and he wants to take a lot of beer. He his, doesn't like a... He's just, he's just he's joking. Like, yeah, stiff, and, and, stiff and, and, neck and yeah, his he, he, he thinks, back. hey, by the way, Sam, stiff neck is biblical, by the way. I'm a, you know, it's it's a biblical thing to be a stiff neck. <laughs> so Sam Shamoon is, uh, will be, will be coming and working with Al-Fadi, but he loves to, he loves to riddle us and to ribe us and to try to do, make all kinds of, make us look like fools. Uh, it aggrandizes himself, makes him look big, and he likes to look big. Uh, but God bless him. I liked his mind, and he certainly loves to take on and eradicate Islam. I just wish he would be a little more humble in his approach. But then that's that's his that's Sam, that's unique to him. It's not my style. It's not it's not Al Fadi's style. I am uh, we, always amazed uh, the uniqueness of um, brothers and sisters in Christ as they engage or as they express their love towards God. Like we are all very different, very unique because our God is unique. But Amen. still, we have one purpose alone. We are willing to be, God is willing to use us for the kingdom. And I'm just so encouraged how everyone is um, practicing their gifts for the kingdom. Now, let me ask you, um, Hatu, at the beginning of this show, you hated me. At the big, uh, I do understand I'm on your killing list, and I know that. It's hard to it's not uh, it's hard to get onto that killing list, and so I'm proud to finally be on it again. Uh, I do expect the next time you see me, you will try to destroy me and try to humiliate me and try to get me down to my knees like you've always done. Uh, but I uh, may be encouraged that uh, though I don't have a killing list right yet, I am starting and thinking seriously about actually starting creating one just for your sake. We did not have the uh, live stream we wanted to have. We were not able to get this on Facebook simultaneously. I yeah, feel bad about that. Unfortunately, Hatun, uh, all bad things uh, happen all at once. And, you know, the enemy, of course, wants to attack. The, Satan, uh, I should say, wants to attack, of course, these kind of things. But uh, as uh, uh, Jay mentioned, we would love, Hatun, to begin to have you join us every time we're doing these kind of live streams uh, in the studio. And uh, certainly we'll uh, do a better job next time as to how we can get this accomplished in a smooth manner. Yeah, that, that's fine. Um, I already I already expressed it is 
fault of Jay because it's always fault of someone else. It is never it, my, it, fault, it, my fault. It's Blake's fault. I'm the nice guy, by the way. I, I mean, like to yeah. I like to take the credit for that. It, it, uh, it, it, it actually it feels makes me feel right at home. Can you see? I'm an angel. I have this halo on my head. Yeah. I've got yeah. The black I've got the black shirt and I've got the black vest to prove it. Yeah. So that uh, was that was miscommunication between. Uh, J to probably my phone or something, <laughs> not to me, but to my phone, I think, I don't know. Um, anyway, we didn't, um, this is not something we planned, it was something else, but by God's grace, we are just getting getting to know each other better, and I can see there are some people who are like having fun in the chat as well, so it's absolutely fine. God bless him. Listen, Sam, get here quickly. We're getting to your hotel room. Make sure you have a live stream tonight. Enjoy the audience you do, your hour to two hour tirades. God bless you. It's great to know that we're on the same team. And I'm glad to see that God has gifted you for that. For the others, Bart Connolly, I really enjoy your comments. It's terrific to see the kind of work you're doing. Uh, uh, fascinating the material that you're coming up with. It's always engaging to have you on board. The others that I see here, I mean, we've been looking at your comments while we're listening to Hatoon. And it's been exciting to see that people do take this seriously. And we are, have almost already, what, 240 people that are, that are watching us uh, live. This yeah. has been a good chat. We will do more of these. Hatoon, I'm sorry for the technical problems. Blame it on me. I love taking blame for that. I have uh, felt one thing I don't understand is one thing I don't understand is as you say I am sorry you look very happy I'm not sure what kind of sorry face is that Jay you need to do some work on it same token that I'm on your killing list when I <laughs> smile I'm angry oh boy so I want to apologize to all of my followers who are joining us here as well for the uh, uh, technical issue because we announce it uh, on my Facebook page and uh, we were expecting it to be done differently so we promise we will also have a copy of this uh, uh, posted on Facebook and also maybe even on my YouTube channel we'll keep you posted God bless you from the studios where Al Fadi and I have been doing an awful lot of videos. We're going to continue. We've got to go because we've got a whole other team that's waiting for us to do some more videos. Uh, those will all be up on CIDA International. They'll also be up on DCCI and they'll also be up on Fander Films. So all three of us will be getting this live stream to put up later as well. Hatun, thank you for letting us. Uh, for hosting this, for letting us come on your channel and being with you for I don't know what has it been about an hour, an hour and a half. Uh, God bless you for the many things you do do. And uh, listen, we're, we're going to be hearing more about not only this, especially this historical material. Lo this material star is starting to come out in not just drips anymore. It's coming out in droves. Uh, and it all is showing that uh, there was the wrong man at the wrong place doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. More of that later. This is Hatun and I'm sorry, this is Al-Fadi and me along with Hatun over and out. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Alfadi, for joining us. And Thank God you. bless you all. We will see you on another live stream or we will see you at Speaker's Corner. God bless you all.